elevating the discussion while talking about the things that matter most. You're listening to Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Welcome to Episode 109 of Society and the State. I'm Brian Hyde along with Connor Boyack. Well, you've probably seen a lot of news headlines in in the recent, uh, well, the last few months about uh, a group called Antifa. Now, I've heard a couple of different explanations here, Connor. I'd like to get your take on this. Um, ostensibly, they say Antifa stands for anti-fascist. Although I've heard, and based on their actions, I almost tend to agree with another interpretation, which is anti-FA, which is anti-First Amendment. <laughs> in that uh, they, they really seem to uh, be adamant that there are just some forms of speech they, they cannot tolerate. It's, it's like the, the paradox of intolerance. How do we promote greater tolerance? By being intolerant of ideas that we find intolerable. <laughs> What's scary is that actually makes sense to some people. You know, and, and whether or not it makes sense, whether or not they've thought through what they actually believe in, I think the defining characteristic of Antifa is their predilection for violence. They're, they're willing to uh, what they call uh, use direct action. Right, not not just action, not just uh, not persuasion, direct action in which this is a very uh, confronting, aggressive, in-your-face uh, style of protest, uh, destruction of property, uh, harassment, um, and as you point out, Brian, in recent days we've seen a lot more of this. It's it's telling too that uh, often where Antifa gathers, and and usually they they gather as uh, you know a counter protest to. Uh, you know, the so-called Patriot prayer rallies or the Proud Boys, uh, any anywhere the political right is, is making a show, um, Antifa can be counted on to be there. And, and they uh, mask themselves. And I don't know about you, but uh, I have a problem even with law enforcement masking themselves when they go out to do their work with just the, the idea that if what you're doing has to be done in secret, maybe you should ask yourself whether you should be doing it in the first place. And especially when it comes to just, you know, violently attacking people or destroying property, um, which Antifa has been known to do, those masks, I think, tell us a great deal about the intentions or the motives involved. I think a lot of these people, too, are not necessarily tied to their ideology so much as they like controversy and confrontation. You know, I mean, there, there's certainly a segment of people out there who just like to, you know, rough people up. They just like to watch things burn, right? And and. Uh, these types of altercations attract those type of people. They even attract agent provocateurs, right? People within the government who want to infiltrate these groups, destabilize things, uh, foment, you know, terrorist type activities that will justify governments cracking down and having bigger budgets and more power. Um, and so you get undercover government agents infiltrating these groups. It's happened in the past. It's no doubt happening right now. Um, and so I think that's the problem is that, um, these types of scenarios set us up for uh, controversy where my sense, Brian, is like nothing productive really comes from this. And I think that's what we want to talk about today is, uh, is what they're doing uh, helpful in any way? I mean, certainly if you look back at something like the revolution, ultimately confrontation and conflict was necessary, beneficial, productive, uh, important, you know, all of the above. Um is any of that happening with Antifa and Proud Boys and all of these different protest groups that are conflicting against one another? No. In my opinion, no. And, and it comes down to something that I know you're very familiar with, and that is the non-aggression principle. Um, you know, it's pre, just to, to state it plainly, the non-aggression principle states that you're not justified in using force against another person if you are the initiator of that force. Now, you can use it defensively, but uh, in the case of Antifa and, sadly, in the case of the Proud Boys and some of these other groups that, for whatever reason, just love to duke it out in the streets, both are more than willing to engage in um, the initiation of violence. And unfortunately, that has a spillover effect, which empowers the state, which presses down even harder with the foot that it has on our necks. Mm -hmm. All of us. And um, so there was a, you know, another altercation the other day where Charlie Kirk, who runs the Turning Point USA, kind of like a college-esque uh, right-leaning organization and uh, he was at breakfast with somebody else I think it was in Philly and uh, you know these Antifa protesters show up and you know start chanting and harassing them following them everywhere uh, you know shouting at them cursing at them and and uh, you know I think one of their things was one two three F the bourgeoisie right like <laughs> okay like 
what are you actually conveying? The problem here is, is you know, we may have problems with Charlie Kirk, right? Fine. You may have legitimate disputes against conservatives or what you uh, feel are capitalists or corporatists or fascists or whatever terminology you want to use. But um, I don't know, like even a, going back to the founding fathers and the revolution, like conflict was the last resort. Exactly. It was after multiple attempts to reason with the so-called enemy, to petition the king, to explain the problem, to point out, you know, the harms that were being caused, to try and find a diplomatic solution that would resolve the issue. And after repeated uh, denials, after uh, resistance uh, over and over again by the so-called enemy, the opposition, um, that is when hostilities, you know, and now like hostilities, like the first thing these people are thinking, of, hey, we're just going to get in your face and, you know, we'll boost our Twitter following and we'll get some media. But no one's being educated. No one's hearts are changing. No one's minds are changing. It just seems to me this is really it's letting off steam, but it's not really doing anything other than that. Well, when when your mottos are things like punch a fascist in the face or punch a Nazi in the face, <laughs> and then you go out and anybody who you see who isn't marching in lockstep with you becomes, you know, by your definition, a Nazi. That's a problem. And in, in the case of uh, Charlie Kirk, he was with Candace Owens. They were having breakfast uh, the other day. Now, Candace Owens is a black woman. Mm. And I hope people can appreciate the irony of a bunch of these Antifa protesters attacking this black woman, attacking Charlie Kirk, shouting at them, harassing them, screaming, down with white supremacy. It was all mostly white you know, <laughs> protesters attacking this black woman and shouting down with white supremacy. Oh, my God. It's, it's as bad as the symbol that I saw um, following Charlottesville last year uh -huh. where, where there was a rally that turned violent. And, you know, you had a, this picture of a guy being beaten with a sign that said, stop the hate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's like the the redundant uh, government department of redundancy or whatever. <laughs> it's like the irony that these people have is lost on them. The 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 challenge that I have, Brian, like I want to change things, right? There are problems. There are reasons to disagree and even forcefully, strongly object with other people that are doing things we don't like or we think are counterproductive or harmful. So no doubt there's there's dispute. There's reason for dispute. There's opportunity to change, but if anything, I think that these actions are not not only not helpful, but even counterproductive because you lose the opportunity to build a bridge, to gain understanding, to find common ground, to compromise. And that's not to say that at the end of the day, people on a totally different ideology from yourself that you want to compromise with them or that they are willing to understand your point of view or that you can even engage in diplomatic conversation with these people to even see if there are uh, similarities or common ground that you can build on. Uh, I sense that these people are, are not sophisticated or, or patient or interested enough to even engage in that. But um, to my mind, this is like French revolutionary type of stuff. Absolutely. They would be right at home with the Jacobins. Yeah, because there's it's just let's burn this all down. And, and I loved. OK, so um, John Adams and his wife, Abigail, would often correspond with one another. And we have many most of, uh, of their letters saved and it's a really insightful look into the mind of of uh, a very influential and important figure in history of figures plural because abigail was quite a spitfire and very intelligent woman who was a good support to her husband and that's not to say everything john adams did was was wonderful and peachy keen i'll uh tangentially mention the alien and sedition acts which were Ooh. <laughs> horrible right he was awful for doing that but nonetheless you know brilliant guy and as the French Revolution was happening, of course, that was the reason for which the Alien Sedition Acts were passed. But again, that's kind of a tangent. Uh, if you, dear listener, are not familiar with the Alien and Sedition Acts, I would encourage you to, to go Google that and look it up. It's a very dark part of American history, especially by the very generation that produced the Constitution uh, and fought in the Revolution. But the French Revolution was happening, and... Uh, John Adams wrote to his wife, Abigail, I'm only going to paraphrase here. I didn't pull it up in front of me because I just thought of this, but he says something to the effect of my concern is that there are too many people who want to tear the system down, but too few who know what to build in its place. And I think that's what we see in these types of movements is uh, a, a tendency and a temptation to just tear institutions down, tear people down, without having any idea of what you would want to replace it with. Maybe those would be good ideas in some uh, cases, in the sense of an, 
case of Antifa. I sense that that's not the case. Nevertheless, um, I think we have to give attention to and give thought to if we do want to tear things. I want to tear a whole lot of stuff down, right? Like past episode, I want to tear the TSA down. You know, what do I want to leave in this place? Nothing, right? Like, I think that's a very fair thing. But largely speaking, you can't just point out a problem and try and tear it down. You have to have some sort of solution. I don't think these guys have any. And I think it comes down, too, to the motivation. Why would you want to see the TSA done away with? Privacy, personal security, liberty. Strictly your own or? Or for everybody. Exactly. And that's, the, I think, one of the defining characteristics of, of Antifa and the uh, Marxist ideology that underlies their anger is there's a hatred and an envy of anyone who appears to be better off than them. And I don't just mean financially secure. I mean stable in their lives or stable in their thinking. Um, there, there's a lot of anger out there. I, I don't know if you saw after uh, the protest at Berkeley just a couple of weekends ago, um, the, the Antifa protesters who were going around smashing the windows out of the Marine Corps recruiting office and, uh, you know, tried to set a car on fire. They, they, were, they were doing destructive stuff. Well, a bunch of them got arrested, and the uh, Berkeley Police Department published their photos without their masks. And, of course, they're crying, well, this is unfair. People are going to dox us. They're going to seek us out. They're going to know who we are. And uh, we're going to have accountability for our actions. On the one hand, I'm like, yeah, I, I hate that uh, mugshots, you know, become uh, public information. And, and a lot of people, they see the mugshot and they're like, whoa, you know, you're guilty. You must be guilty or you wouldn't be in that mugshot. Yep. But at the same time, the fact that these guys do what they do with masks, I'm kind of glad to see them unmasked. And I'm glad to see their faces put out there before the public because maybe people need to be aware of who they are and what they're doing. Let me ask you, Brian, do you, uh, you've been paying attention to this a little more than I have, I think. So let me ask you, is it your sense that this is uh, uh, being fomented by kind of the Trump movement? And also, whether because of Trump or not, do you sense that these types of protests and encounters will be increasing in the years ahead? It does appear to be increasing, at least from my vantage point. Um, and, and I think that's best evidence, not so much by the, the street demonstrations and the, you know, bare knuckle brawls in the street as um, just there's a, there's a growing divide in America that uh, is, is characterized by people who just are like, we can't talk to each other. We have nothing to say to each other. Historically, that's a very precarious place to be. Um, the Balkans, I'll just bring up the, the specter of what happened there, you know, 25 years ago. Um, that was some of the ugliest stuff humanity has, has ever seen. But it came into being because the groups involved had, you know, I mean, they've been in, in conflict and had friction with each other for a long time, but they got to the point where we have nothing to say to each other. Okay, so what's left? Mm-hmm. Conflict. Mm-hmm. That's really that's really all that's left. And and I see that uh, that same kind of dynamic building. Antifa just happens to be one of the more visible symptoms of it. It seems to me, too, on that same point about conflict being the ultimate resolution for your ideas that... Uh, if these Antifa people have any brains and they see that short of getting some media attention, they're not actually affecting any change. You got to wonder when the light bulb moment turns on and says, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to plant a bomb or I'm going to go, you know, call in a terrorist threat. I'm going to do whatever, right. To, uh, start to actually, uh, affect a little bit more change. We would say in a very negative way, but that is kind of the, the path that they're going down. And short of having voices out there or even within their own ranks that are discouraging them from marching down that path, you got to wonder how quickly and, and, and when and, and, and if it's just eventual and presumed to happen at this point that these types of conflicts are going uh, to lead to that. Again, you know, I may agree with these people on some of their ideas of the problems of, you know, fascism and, and corporatism, crony capitalism and so forth, but... Um, where I think we could kind of join forces and pursue some common ground is totally lost when uh, their you know, first effort is just to go confront, harass, and, and destroy. It's interesting to me, too, that uh, uh, professional alarmist groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center, whose job is to demonize, smear, and create fear and antipathy in uh, public officials towards basically anybody who is to the, uh, to the left of uh, Bernie Sanders, they do not list Antifa. To the right of Bernie Sanders? I'm sorry, to the right of yeah. Bernie Sanders. <laughs> uh, they don't list Antifa as a hate group. Wow. And the explanation they give is, well, you know, we condemn violence in all of its forms, including the acts of uh, Antifa, but the propensity for violence, they say, 
is not among the criteria for listing. So Antifa groups don't promote hatred based on religion, ethnicity, uh, race, sexual orientation, or gender identity. So because they, they embrace some ideological common ground, they're willing to excuse the initiation of violence on the part of groups like Antifa, whereas, uh, you know, someone like, for instance, the Bundy family, who stood up against what uh, they perceived as unjust government abuse of their rights, are labeled as domestic terrorists, extremists, dangerous. They've got to be they've got to be crushed. Wow. Very telling. It is telling indeed. And, and it's OK from Southern Poverty Law Center's vantage point to hate the majority. It's OK to hate white people. It's OK. To, and <laughs> you've heard about this New York Times editor, right? Oh, Whose social yeah. media is filled with, oh, white people suck and they should just die and they're awful and this and that. I all get this of, sick pleasure out of being cruel to white men. Right. Wow. Filled with that. And mm. so the New York Times just excuse, oh, it's in her past. Oh, you know, whereas uh, <laughs> if, if she had said that about black people, for there's no way the New York Times would have allowed her to stay. So someone on Twitter, I, I didn't I don't have this prepared to talk about in any great length, but I saw this the other day that someone on Twitter uh, took her tweets and changed them so that rather than talking about white people. She talked about Jewish people, but all the words were the same, right? I get a great delight out of seeing Jewish men you suffer or whatever. All these negative things about Jews. And she got suspended for violating Twitter's terms of, of use. That was Candace Owen. Was that, it? That was the one who got attacked oh, in Philadelphia Interesting. along with Charlie Kirk. And it points out the utter hypocrisy here, the double standard, right? And that, to me, is the big problem, is that uh, hate is okay, according to the so-called left, as long as you're hating the groups that we're against. I think there's bad yeah. precedent there. No, I think I think that's about right. Well, if anything, this should spur each one of us to, to think a little more deeply about to, why do we stand for what we stand for? If if your idea of standing for something is to put a mask on your face and go swing a, boc, a bike lock up on the side of somebody's head and then disappear into the crowd, um, you might want to question whether that's the most productive use of, of your uh, time and your talents and, and if it's actually having the effect that you would like. Be sure to uh, subscribe if you haven't already. We'll be back with another great episode of Society and the State. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com.